Chapter 9 The Great Meeting on Stable Hill For a long time, they could not speak nor even shed a tear. Then the unicorn stamped the ground with his hoof, shook his mane, and spoke. Sire, he said, there is now no need of counsel. We see that the ape's plans were laid deeper than we dreamed of. Doubtless he has been long in secret traffic with the Tisrock, and as soon as he found the lion's skin, he sent him word to make ready his navy for the taking of Ker Paravel and all Narnia. Nothing now remains for us seven, but to go back to Stable Hill, proclaim the truth, and take the adventure that Aslan sends us. And if by a great marvel we defeat those thirty Kaler means who are with the ape, then to turn again and die and battle with a far greater host of them that will soon march from Ker Paravel. Tyrion nodded. When he turned to the children, he said, Now, friends, it is time for you to go hence into your own world. Doubtless you have done all that you were sent to do. said Jill, who was shivering, not with fear exactly, but because everything was so horrible. Nay, said the king, you loosed me from the tree. You glided before me like a snake last night in the wood and took puzzle, and you, Eustace, killed your man. But you are too young to share in such a bloody end as we others must meet tonight, or it may be three days hence. I entreat you, nay, I command you to return to your own place. I should be put to shame if I let such young warriors fall in battle on my side. No, 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 said Jill, very white when she began speaking, and suddenly very red, then white again. We won't. I don't care what you say. We're going to stick with you whatever happens, aren't we, Eustace? Yes, but there's no need to get so worked up about it, said Eustace who had stuck his hands in his pockets, forgetting how odd that looks when you're wearing a male shirt. Because, you see, we haven't any choice. What's the good of talking about our going back? How? We've got no magic for doing it. This was very good sense, but at the moment, Jill hated Eustace for saying it. He was fond of being dreadfully matter-of-fact when other people got excited. When Tyrion realized that the two strangers could not get home, unless Aslan suddenly whisked them away, he next wanted them to go across the southern mountains into Archenland, where they might possibly be safe. But they didn't know their way, and there was no one to send with them. Also, as Poggin said, once the Kalermeans had Narnia, they would certainly take Archenland in the next week or so. The Tisrock had always wanted to have those northern countries for his own. In the end, Eustace and Jill begged so hard that Tyrion said they could come with him and take their chance. Or, as much more sensibly called, the adventure that Aslan would send them. The king's first idea was that they should not go back to Stable Hill. They were sick of its very name by now, till after dark. But the dwarf told them that if they arrived there by daylight, they would probably find the place deserted, except perhaps for a Kalermean sentry. The beasts were far too frightened by what the ape, and Ginger, had told them about this new angry Aslan or... Tashlan to go near it except when they were called together for those horrible midnight meetings. And Kaler Means are never good woodsmen. Poggin thought that even by daylight they could be easily got round somewhere behind the stable without being seen. This would be much harder to do when the night had come and the ape might be calling the beasts together and all the Kaler Means were on duty. And when the meeting and when the meeting did begin, they could leave Puzzle at the back of the stable, completely out of sight till the moment at which they wanted to produce him. This is obviously a good thing, for their only chance was to give the Narnians a sudden surprise. Everyone agreed, and the whole party set off on a new line, northwest, towards the hated hill. The eagle sometimes flew to and fro above them, sometimes he sat perched on Puzzle's back. No one, not even the king himself, except in some great need, would dream of riding a unicorn. This time, Jill and Eustace walked together. They'd been feeling very brave when they were begging to be allowed to come with the others, but 
Now, they didn't feel so brave at all. Paul, said Eustace in a whisper, I may as well tell you I've got the wind up. Oh, you are all right, Scrub, said Jill. You can fight, but I'm just shaking if you want to know the truth. Oh, shaking's nothing, said Eustace. I'm feeling I'm going to be sick. Oh, don't talk about that, for goodness sakes, said Jill. They went on in silence for a minute or two. Paul, said Eustace presently. What? she said. What will happen if we get killed here? Well, we'll be dead, I suppose. But I mean, what will happen in our own world? Shall we wake up and find ourselves back on the train? Or shall we just vanish and never be heard of anymore? Or shall we be dead in England? Gosh, I never thought of that. Oh, it would be rum for Peter and the others if they saw me waving out the window and then when the train comes in, we're nowhere to be found. Or if they found two, I mean, if we're dead over there in England. Ugh, said Jill. What a horrid idea. It wouldn't be horrid for us, said Eustace. We shouldn't be there. I almost wish. No, I don't, though, said Jill. What were you going to say? I was going to say I wish we had never come, but I don't. I don't. I don't. Even if we are killed, I'd rather be killed fighting for Narnia than grow old and stupid at home and perhaps go out in a bath chair and then die in the end just the same. Or be smashed up by British railways. Why do you say that? Well, when that awful jerk came, the, the one that seemed to throw us into Narnia, I thought it was the beginning of a railway accident, so I was jolly glad to find ourselves here instead. Well, while Jill and Eustace were talking about this, the others were discussing their plans becoming less miserable. That was because they were now thinking of what was to be done this very night, and the thought of what happened to Narnia, the thought that all her glories and joys were over, was pushed away into the back part of their minds. The moment they stopped talking, it would come out and make them wretched again. But they kept on talking. Poggin was really quite cheerful about the night's work they had to do. He was sure that the boar and the bear and probably all the dogs would come over to their side at once. And he couldn't believe that all the other dwarfs would stick with Griffel. And fighting by firelight and in and out among trees would be advantage to the weaker side. And then if they could win tonight, need they really throw their lives away by meeting the main Kalermine army a few days later? Why not hide in the woods? or even up in the western waste beyond the great waterfall and look like outlaws. And they might gradually get stronger and stronger, for talking beasts and archon landers would be joining them every day, and at last they come out of hiding and sweep the Kaler means, who would have just got careless by now, right out of the country, and Narnia would be revived. After all, something very much like this had happened in the time of King Myraz. Tyrion heard all this and thought, but what about Tash? and felt in his bones that none of it was going to happen. But he didn't say so. When they got near to Stable Hill, of course, everyone became quiet. And the real woodwork began. From the moment at which they first saw the hill to the moment at which they all arrived at the back of the stable, it took them over two hours. It's the sort of thing one couldn't describe properly unless one wrote pages and pages about it. The journey from each bit of cover to the next was a, a separate adventure, and there were very long waits in between and several false alarms. If you are a good scout or a good guide, you will know already what it must have been like. By about sunset, they were all safe in a clump of holly trees about 15 yards behind the stable. They all munched on some biscuit and lay down. Then came the worst part, the waiting. Luckily for the children, they slept for a couple of hours, but of course they woke up when the night grew cold. And what was worse, woke up very thirsty with no chance of getting a drink. Puzzle just stood, shivering a little with nervousness and said nothing. But Tyrion, with his head against Jules flank, slept as soundly as if he were in his royal bed at Care Paravel, till the sound of a gong beating awoke him, and he sat up and saw there was a firelight on the far side of this table, and he knew the hour had come. Kiss me, Jewel, he said, for certainly this is our last night on earth. 
And if ever I offended against you in any manner, great or small, forgive me now. Dear king, said the unicorn, I could almost wish you had, so that I might forgive it. Farewell. We have known great joys together. If Aslan gave me my choice, I would choose no other life than the life I have had, and no other death than the one we go to. Then they woke up Farside, who was asleep with his head under his wing. It made him look as if he had no head at all, and crept forward to the stable. They left Puzzle, not without a kind word, for no one was angry with him now, just behind it, telling him not to move till someone came to fetch him, and took up their position at the end of the stable. The bonfire had not been lit for long, and it was just beginning to blaze up. It was only a few feet away from them, and the great crowd of Narnian creatures were on the other side of it, so that Tyrion could not at first see them very well. Though, of course, he saw dozens of eyes shining with the reflection of the fire. As you've seen a rabbit's or a cat's eyes in the headlight of a car. And just as Tyrion took his place, the gong stopped. From somewhere on his left, three figures appeared. One was Rishda Tarkhan, the Kalermine captain. The second was the ape. He was holding on to the Tarkhan's hand with one paw and kept whimpering and muttering, not so fast. Don't go so fast. I'm not at all well. Oh, my poor head. These midnight meetings are getting too much for me. Apes aren't meant to be up at night. It's not as if I were a rat or a bear. Ah, oh, my poor head. The side of the ape, walking very softly and stately, with his tail straight up in the air, came Ginger the cat. They were headed for the bonfire and were so close to Tyrion that they would have seen him at once if, he had looked, if they had looked in the right direction. Fortunately, they did not. But Tyrion heard Rishda say to Ginger in a low voice, Now, cat, to the post. See thou play thy part well. Meow. Meow, count on me, said Ginger. Then he stepped away beyond the bonfire and sat down in the front row of the assembled beasts in the audience, as you might say. For really, as it happened, the whole thing was rather like theater. The crowd of Narnians were like the people in the seats, in the little grassy place in front of the stable where the bonfire burned and the ape and the captain stood to talk to the crowd was like the stage. The stable itself was like the scenery at the back of the stage, and Tyrion and his friends were like people peering round from behind the scenery. It was a splendid position. If any of them stepped forward into the full firelight, all eyes would be fixed on him at once. On the other hand, as long as they stood still in the shadow of the end wall of the stable, it was a hundred to one against them being noticed. Rishda Tarkhan dragged the ape up close to the fire. The pair of them turned to face the crowd, and this, of course, meant that their backs were toward Tyrion and his friends. Now, monkey, said Rishda Tarkhan in a low voice, Say the words that wiser heads have put into your mouth, and hold up thy head. As he spoke, he gave the ape a little prod or kick from behind with the point of his toe. Oh, do leave me alone, muttered Shift. But he sat up straighter and began in a louder voice. Now, listen, all of you. A terrible thing has happened, a wicked thing, the wickedest thing that's ever been done in Narnia, and Aslan, Tashlan, fool, whispered Rishta Tarkhan. Uh, Tashlan, I mean, of course, very, very angry about it. There was a terrible silence while the beasts waited to hear what the new trouble was in store for them. The little party by the end wall of the stable also held their breath. What on earth was coming now? Yeah, said the ape. At this uh, very moment when the terrible one himself is among us, there in the stable just behind me, one wicked beast has chosen to do what you think no one would ever dare do if he were a thousand miles away. He has dressed himself up in a lion's skin and is wandering around in these very woods pretending to be Aslan. Jill wondered for a moment if the ape had gone mad. Was he going to tell the whole truth? 
A roar of horror and rage went up from the beasts. Ah! came the growls. Where is he? Where is he? Let me get my teeth into him! It was seen last night, screamed the ape. But it got away! It's a donkey, you common miserable ass! If any of you see that ass! Roar, growled the beasts. We will, we will. He better keep out of our way. Jill looked at the king, and his mouth was open, and his face was full of horror. And then she understood the devilish cunning of the enemy's plan. By mixing in a little truth with what they had made, they had made their lie far stronger. What was the good now of telling the beasts that an ass had been dressed up as a lion to deceive them? The ape would only say, well, that's just what I said. What would be the good of showing them puzzle in his lion skin? They would only tear him to pieces. That's taken the wind out of our sails, whispered Eustace. The ground is taken from under our feet, said Tyrion. Cursed, cursed cleverness, said Poggin. I'll be sworn that this new lie is of Ginger's making. And that's the end of chapter 9. And so our friends go to do what they are convinced is the only thing they can do. They don't think they'll win. They don't even think they'll survive. But now is the time, whether they live or whether they die, they are going to do the right thing, and they're going to go down fighting. And maybe, just maybe, there was a chance. And maybe, just maybe, even... Poggin's crazy hope that they could somehow recreate the circumstances of Caspian and Myraz with the uh, outlaw rebels hiding in the woods and little by little retaking and reclaiming the land of Narnia. But now, now even the best parts of the plan are right out the window for the lies of the ape and of Ginger and of the Tarkhan. Well... The lie with just enough truth sprinkled in to take away all of the power and all of the faith that people might have seen in seeing the real truth for the first time. Oh, how tricky, how dangerous it is when people mix in just enough truth to not only make what they say sound plausible, realistic even, but then undercut when people bring the real truth to light. I wasn't sure the situation could get any worse, and maybe it just did. What do they have left other than to stand and fight? Is this their last stand, a hopeless fight against hopeless odds? So far, one by one, with every plan coming to nothing and all their hopes falling away, we'll just have to wait and see what could possibly happen next.